This audio presentation of Neville Goddard's Consciousness is the Only Reality from the 1948 Lesson Series is brought to you by AudioEnlightenment.com. Copyright 2012. All rights reserved. Lesson 1. Consciousness is the Only Reality. This is going to be a very practical course. Therefore, I hope that everyone in his class has a very clear picture of what he desires. For I am convinced that you can realize your desires by the technique you will receive here this week in these five lessons. That you may receive the full benefit of the instructions, let me state now that the Bible is no reference at all to any persons who ever existed or to any event that ever occurred upon earth. The ancient storytellers were not writing history, but an allegorical picture lesson of certain basic principles which they clothed in the garb of history, and they adapted these stories to the limited capacity of the most uncritical and credulous people. Throughout the centuries, we have mistakenly taken personifications for persons, allegory for history, the vehicle that conveyed the instruction for the instruction, and the gross first sense for the ultimate sense intended. The difference between the form of the Bible and its substance is as great as the difference between a grain of corn and the life germ within the grain. As our assimilative organs discriminate between food that can be built into our system and food that must be discarded, so do we awaken intuitive faculties discovered beneath allegory and parable, the psychological life germ of the Bible. And feeding on this, we too cast off the form which conveyed the message. The argument against the historicity of the Bible is too lengthy. Consequently, it is not suitable for inclusion in this practical psychological interpretation of its stories. Therefore, I will waste no time in trying to convince you that the Bible is not a historical fact. Tonight, I will take four stories and show you what the ancient storytellers intended that you and I should see in these stories. The ancient teachers attached psychological truth to phallic and solar allegories. They did not know as much of the physical structure as man as do modern scientists. Neither did they know as much about the heavens as do our modern astronomers. But the little they did know they used wisely and they built phallic and solar frames to which they tied the great psychological truth that they had discovered. In the Old Testament you will find much of the phallic worship. But it is not helpful. I am not going to emphasize it. I show only how to interpret it. Before we come to the first of the psychological dramas that you and I may use in our practical sense, let me state the two outstanding names of the Bible. The one you and I translate as God or Jehovah, and the one we call His Son, which we have as Jesus. The ancients spelled these names by using symbols. The ancient tongue, called the Hebraic language, was not a tongue that you exploded with the breath. It was a mystical language never uttered by man. Those who understood it, understood it as the mathematicians understand symbols of higher mathematics. It is not something people use to convey thought, as I now use the English language. They said that God's name was spelled, jod he va he I shall take these symbols and our normal down-to-earth language explain them in this manner. The first letter, J-O-D, in the name God is the hand or the seed. Not just a hand, but the hand of the director. If there is one organ of man that discriminates and sets him apart from the entire world of creation, it is his hand. What we call a hand in the anthropoid ape is not a hand. It is used only for the purpose of conveying food to the mouth or swing from branch to branch. Man's hand fashions, it molds. You can't really express yourself without the hand. This is the builder's hand the hand of the director. It directs and molds and builds within your world. The ancient storytellers call the first letter Jod, J-O-D, the hand, or the absolute seed out of which the whole of creation will come. The second letter, H-E, he, they gave the symbol of a window. A window is an eye. The window is to the house that the eye is to the body. The third letter, V-A-U, vow, they called a nail. A nail is used for the purpose of binding things together. The conjunction N in the Hebraic tongue is simply the third letter or vow, V-A-U. If I want to say man and woman, I put the va in the middle. It binds them together. The fourth and last letter, H-E, he, is another window or eye. 
In this modern, down-to-earth language of ours, you can forget eyes and windows and hands and look at it in this manner. You are seated here now. This first letter, Jod, is your I amness, your awareness. You are aware of being aware. That is the first letter. Out of this awareness, all states of awareness come. The second letter, H-E, he, called an I, is your imagination, your ability to perceive. You imagine or perceive something which seems to be other than self, as though you were lost in reverie and contemplated mental states in a detached manner, making the thinker and his thoughts separate entities. The third letter, vow, is your ability to feel you are that which you desire to be. As you feel you are it, you become aware of being it. You walk as though you were and want to be, is to take your desire out of the imaginary world and put the vow upon it. You have completed the drama of creation. I am aware of something. Then I become aware of actually being that of which I was aware. The fourth and last letter in the name of God is another H-E, He, another I, meaning the visible objective world which constantly bears witness of that which I am conscious of being. You do nothing about the objective world. It always molds itself in harmony with that which you are conscious of being. You are told this is the name by which all things are made, and without it there is nothing made that is made. The name is simply what you have now as you are seated here. You are conscious of being, aren't you? Certainly you are. You are also conscious of something that is other than yourself, the room, the furniture, the people. You may become more selective now. Maybe you do not want to be here other than what you are or you own what you see. But you have the capacity to feel what it would be like were you now other than what you are. As you assume that you are that which you want to be, you have completed the name of God or the jod he vahe The final result, the objectification of your assumption, is not your concern. It will come into view automatically as you assume the consciousness of being it. Now let us turn to the Son's name, for He gives the Son dominion over the world. You are that Son. You are the great Joshua, or Jesus of the Bible. You know the name Joshua, or Jehoshua, as we have anglicized as Jesus. The Son's name is almost like the Father's name. The first three letters of the Father's name are the first three letters of the Son's name. Jad He Va. Then you add a Shin, S-H-I-N, and a A-Y-I-N, making the son's name read Jod He Va Shin Ayin. You have heard what the first three are, Jod He Va. Jod means that you are aware. He means that you are aware of something. And Va means that you become aware of being that of which you are aware. You have dominion because you have the ability to conceive and to become that which you conceive. That is the power of creation. But why is a shin, S-H-I-N, put in the name of the Son? Because of the infinite mercy of our Father. Mind you, the Father and Son are one. But when the Father becomes conscious of being man, he puts within the condition called man that which he did not give unto himself. He puts a shin for his purpose. A shin is symbolized as a tooth. A tooth is that which consumes, that which devours. I must have within me the power to consume that which I now dislike. I, in my ignorance, brought to birth certain things I now dislike and would like to leave behind me. Were there not within me the flames that would consume it, I would be condemned forever to live in a world of all my mistakes. But there is a shin, or flame, within the name of the Son, which allows the Son to become detached from states he formerly expressed within the world. Man is incapable of seeing other than the contents of his own consciousness. If I now become detached in consciousness from this room by turning my attention away from it, then I am no longer conscious of it. There is something in me that devours it within me. It can only live within my objective world if I keep it alive within my consciousness. It is the Shin, or a tooth, in the Son's name that gives him absolute dominion. Why could it not have been in the Father's name? For this simple reason, nothing can cease to be in the Father. Even the unlovely things cannot cease to be. If I once give it expression, forever and ever it remains locked within the dimensionally greater self which is the Father. 
but I would not like to keep alive within my world all of my mistakes. So I, in my infinite mercy, gave to myself, when I became man, the power to become detached from these things that I, in my ignorance, brought to birth in my world. These are the two names which give you dominion. You have dominion if, as you walk the earth, you know that your consciousness is God, the one and only reality. You become aware of something you would like to express or possess. You have the ability to feel that you are and possess that which but a moment before was imaginary. The final result, the embodiment of your assumption, is completely outside of the offices of a three-dimensional mind. It comes to birth in a way that no man knows. If these two names are clear in your mind's eye, you will see that they are your eternal names. As you sit here, you are this Jodhi Vahe. You are the Jodhi Va Shin Ayan. The stories of the Bible concern themselves exclusively with the power of imagination. They are really dramatizations of the technique of prayer, for prayer is the secret of changing the future. The Bible reveals the key by which man enters a dimensionally larger world for the purpose of changing the conditions of the lesser world in which he lives. A prayer granted implies that something is done in consequence of the prayer, which otherwise could not have been done. Therefore, man is the spring of action, the directing mind, and the one who grants the prayer. The stories of the Bible contain a powerful challenge to the thinking capacity of man the underlying truth, that they are psychological dramas and not historical facts, demands reiteration, inasmuch it is the only justification for the stories. With a little imagination we may easily trace the psychological sense in all the stories of the Bible.